If you're in slow tanks and make no mistake, you've come to the right place. Just give to Neil the time to straight up blow your mind with a new show of drawing a blank. So the release of Veil of Shadows has come and gone. The third book in the Broken Code arc in Warriors and the Warriors fandom is still freaking out over the events that have transpired in that book and how much crazy BS happened in it. More than ever, I'm seeing people getting really invested in Warriors again, which was first kind of spurred on by how good Shattered Sky was and how much great new fan content has been created since then. And now The Broken Code is three books in and has been consistently the most exciting Warriors has been in a really long time. I had a lot of hopes for this book, especially seeing how the last book left off, and since this is the mid-series book, I was ready for things to get crazy. And oh boy, they sure did. So... Why did I dislike this book so much? Uh... Alright. First things first, this will be a spoiler-filled video. If you haven't read Veil of Shadows yet and don't want to be told in excruciating detail all the plot points, you might want to go on and get out of here. Have a great week! I'll see you next time. Next thing I'm going to say is that, yes, this is going to be a negative review of the book. I normally like to think I'm a pretty positive Warriors fan, and even when I'm criticizing this series, I'm doing it from a place of love. And usually I enjoy this series for what it is, even if I'm well aware of its flaws. However, like always, you can count on me to try to not be hyperbolic in my analysis here. While I disliked the book, I certainly didn't hate it, and I'm still interested to see where the Broken Code is going, even if I feel like the writing is on the wall now that I'm going to end up being pretty disappointed by the end result. So, where do we even begin? I think a quick summary of the events so far of this arc is in order, because I know not everyone keeps up with the books, but don't mind spoilers, this is going to be a bit of a long one. So let's get started. Our main characters this time are Shadow Sight, the Shadow Clan Medicine Cat, who is the child of Dovewing and Tiger Heart Star. He has a, let's call it, peculiar connection to his spirituality, and ever since he was a kid, he's had seizures related to seeing prophecies, which made him a bit of an outcast and made his parents worried about his future health. This aspect of his character has slowly but surely vanished completely over time, and he's now just kind of your typical medicine cat protagonist, but hey, at least he actually wanted the job, so that's an improvement. Rootspring, who is a Sky Clan apprentice for the first two and a half books and has just recently been made a warrior. He is the child of Violet Shine and Tree. At first, Rootspring resented his relationship to Tree, but he's grown to respect him over time. It's nice. And Bristlefrost, a Thunder Clan warrior, the daughter of Ivy Pool and Fernsong. She's quick witted, but naive, and desperate for attention and validation, especially that of her crush, Stemleaf, and her leader, Bramble Star. Really love Bristlefrost. These characters are all great. They are what made me so excited to get into this arc to begin with because they have obvious flaws and room to grow as characters. I'm a little upset how Shadow Sight has been toned down more into a generic role, but I'm more than willing to forgive it considering everything else going on. Anyway, in Lost Stars, the clans can't communicate with Star Clan, not even the Medicine Cats. It's been a particularly harsh winter and the moon pool is frozen over. The clans are freaking out about this when Shadowpaw seemingly gets a message from Star Clan, or at least a Star Clan cat, who tells Shadowpaw that there are code breakers in the clans that need to be punished for their crimes, including Squirrel Flight, Dovewing, Twig Branch, Crowfeather, Mothwing, Lion Blaze, Jayfeather, and others. Shadowpaw is reluctant to share this message because of the implications it has, but worries that if he doesn't push through with trying to fulfill this prophecy, StarClan might never return. Meanwhile, Rootpaw falls in love with Bristlefrost after she saves him from nearly drowning in the frozen lake, and Bristlefrost gets rejected by her love interest Stemleaf. Who is awesome! He is the best major minor character the books have introduced in ThunderClan for quite a while. He's brave, charming, a good friend, and just has a lot of hero vibes. Kinda generic, yeah, but I'm just happy to see a non-main character get some development like this. Bramblestar gets sick and no one knows how to cure him, except Shadowpaw, who is given more instructions from this Star Clan cat he's been talking to, to bury Bramblestar into a snowdrift and that will somehow heal him. They do this and Bramblestar dies. Whoops! 
And since the clans can't communicate with Star Clan, Bramble Star doesn't receive his next life and can't return to his body. So it looks like Shadow Paw just killed Bramble Star for good. Yay! But then, when Bramble Star is about to be buried, he miraculously wakes up again, but seems to be acting strangely. Lost Stars ends on that horrifying note and is a fantastic starting point for this arc, and I still stand by it. The characters are great, the setup is something completely new and fresh, and we get main characters from three of the five clans. Awesome. Then we get to Silent Thaw, where we find out it is absolutely someone possessing Bramble Star's body, most likely the same cat who's talking to Shadow Paw, who is 100%, without a doubt, Ashfur. Although the authors like to pretend like it's some big secret mystery to solve, it's been obvious since book one that it is Ashfur, and they are still dropping obvious hints like bricks without outright confirming it, and it's honestly getting a little grating at this point. If we don't get the Ashfur reveal in the first few chapters of Darkness Within, I am going to die a little on the inside. The longer you drag this on, Urins, the more people are going to be disappointed when you reveal that yes, it is just Ashfur. Please, just get this over with. Anyway, in Silent Thaw, Ashfur is using Bramble Star's body to continue pushing his Code Breakers Must Be Punished agenda, and also uses Bramble Star's body to get freaky with Squirrel Flight. Which is, yeah, hella dark! And no, the books don't ever outright confirm it, but they sure do imply it. You know it, I know it, it's messed up! Moving on! Meanwhile, Rootpaw is seeing Bramble Star's ghost and knows that the cat inside the ThunderClan leader is an imposter. Bristlefrost is at first eager to please this imposter and spies on her clanmates for him. It is super cool to see a protagonist be manipulated like this. I love the drama. Briss comes to her senses about it though and eventually turns double agent for the rebels who want to take Bramble Star down. Brash Star does many creepy and horrible things throughout this book, including exiling cats from ThunderClan who are code breakers, making Bristlefrost the deputy of ThunderClan so that he can spend more time with Squirrel Flight, <laughs> set up a trap that nearly kills Sparkpelt, and then eventually banishes Squirrel Flight and starts to make the other leaders believe in this punishing code breakers rhetoric, and ThunderClan has become a place of fear and distrust. Some cats, like Berry Nose, Bumble Stripe, and Thornclaw, are sucking up to or approve of this <clears throat> brash new Bramble Star, while other ThunderClan cats, like Stemleaf and his girlfriend Spotfur, are trying to organize with the other clans and make a rebel force to take Bramble Star out. Oh, yeah, and then Brash Star kills Shadow Sight at the end of the book. Hell yeah, that is a great cliffhanger. Silent Thaw was a good follow-up to Lost Stars. I do find that the book talks in circles a lot, though, and doesn't really lead to a whole lot actually happening, which is my biggest complaint with the book. Brash Star is creepy in concept alone, and he certainly tries to further his plans, but the repeated failure of his attempts to sway the other leaders and the pointless exiling of Codebreakers versus just straight up killing them or even making examples of them makes it feel like nothing is really happening. But overall, it's a solid follow-up to Lost Stars on the condition that the next book would pick up the pace a bit. <sighs> and then we get to that next book, Veil of Shadows. And I can only describe my experience with reading this book as a test of frustration. We have a great setup here. An imposter posing as ThunderClan's leader. ThunderClan dividing into supporters for this imposter and rebels. No StarClan communication to get the clans out of this. A push for the clans to punish Codebreakers horribly and violently, which they can totally justify with the Warrior Code. A poorly written romance between Bristlefrost and Rootspring that they can use for even more character drama. A dead main character who is a medicine cat that could have been the tipping scale to make all of this really start to go down. Even if Shadow Sight didn't end up dead, attacking a medicine cat like that should have prompted an immediate war. All of this is beautiful, beautiful setup. And what happens? The characters mainly talk in circles about who the imposter could possibly be and what should we do about him over and over. 
add in a few pointless subplots about Root Spring, training to become a medicine cat that goes absolutely nowhere, Bristle Frost confessing feelings to Root Spring completely out of nowhere, and Shadow Sight spending half of the book being basically dead and sitting on his thumbs with Spire Sight, just Oh my god, please get to the killing already and do something! You cannot have stakes this high and continue avoiding conflict. It is driving me absolutely bonkers. Okay, I'm getting ahead of myself. Warriors books do this. I'm used to it. Honestly, I'm always disappointed about Warriors never living up to its potential, but I've always managed to enjoy the books regardless. Narrowly avoiding conflict and talking in circles is the bread and butter of Warrior Cats at this point, However, this time I can't help but feel deeply unsatisfied at how this is all turning out. So in Veil of Shadows, Brash Star is upset that Squirrelflight is gone and basically stops pushing forward any of his plans because he misses her so much. Barry Nose is the new deputy of ThunderClan, even though Barry Nose has never had an apprentice, so that means that according to the Warrior Code, he can't be deputy. But honestly, I don't think this book remembers any of the code, aside from the Forbidden Relationships rule, because that seems to be the only one that they're focusing on. <laughs> Bristlefrost is pretending to be close with Brash Star and one of his supporters, but is actually working with Squirrel Flight and the other rebels and exiled cats, who now include Crowfeather and Mothwing. Oh yeah. I need to take a moment and scream here. Okay, so this is just further proof that the only bit of the code that matters is the forbidden relationship rule. So I thought, silly me, that Mothwing was being targeted with the other code breakers because she was an atheist medicine cat. You know, that thing that's gotten her in trouble before and would seem like something that the clans would punish her for. Uh. No, apparently not. Misty Star exiles Mothwing because her father was Tiger Star and her mother was Sasha. Let me go over that again. Misty Star, the daughter of Blue Star and Oakheart, exiles Mothwing because her parents were in a forbidden, code breaking relationship. Again, I'm used to Warriors forgetting its own lore from time to time, but these inconsistencies are all over this book. This isn't just something a little silly like Graystripe saying that Misty Star is his daughter or Heavy Step coming back to life multiple times because the authors don't remember he's dead. This is lore being broken and forgotten for the sake of moving the plot forward, even if it doesn't make any sense. And in many ways, this arc is trying to be a mystery, but how am I, as the reader, supposed to follow along with any of this when I'm left guessing which parts of Warrior's canon the authors remember or not? Which leads me to the situation with Shadow Sight and Spire Sight. Shadow Sight has been slowly losing blood and dying at the bottom of a ravine for the past several days. His spirit wakes up to find the ghost of Spire Sight watching over him. Spire Sight says that he hasn't gone to get Shadow Sight help because he doesn't know who did this to him or who Shadow Sight can trust. Okay, reasonable. So Shadow Sight needs to figure out who tried to murder him, even though again, it's obvious that Brash Star did it, before he can save himself. Okay, that makes some sense. Except it turns out that the only person who can help Shadow Sight is Root Spring, because Root Spring is the only one that can see Spire Sight's ghost. So we spend quite a few chapters leaving Shadow Sight in a near death coma for no reason other than it being convenient for the plot. There is a whole bit where Spire Sight is asking Shadow Sight if he can really trust Puddle Shine, and when Shadow Sight says yes, Spire Sight is like, cool. I'll go get Rootpaw then, so that you can be taken to the Sky Clan Medicine Cats. The conversation literally went, Can I trust Puddleshine to come help you? Yes. Great. I'll go get not Puddleshine. <sighs> and as the events of this book play out, you are kind of led to wonder if Spider Sight is purposefully trying to keep Shadow Sight dead and if he's working with Ashfur. Bright Guardian Akira has a video on this that covers the idea of the theory, and it's basically the same thoughts I was having while reading the book. But again, 
The problem here is character consistency and motivation. Spire in Tigerheart Shadow was not presented as someone who is at all bitter towards clan cats, and even in this book there's hardly anything suggesting that Spire Sight isn't being earnest and sincere with Shadow Sight. But his reasoning for not getting Shadow Sight help is all kinds of backwards. And then we get to the scene I'm drawing. The scene that has definitely left the biggest impact on me and was undoubtedly the best moment of the book. It is a really great scene. Shadow Sight's spirit is walking through ThunderClan and he follows Brash Star into the leader's den. Then Ashfur drops Bramble Star's body like a wet blanket and Shadow Sight and Ashfur have a spirit to spirit conversation. It's pretty bone chilling. Ashfur admits to being the cat who attacked Shadow Sight, duh. And then also tells Shadow Sight that he has the power to influence other spirits, like that skinny black Tom with the yellow eyes. Which, okay, could mean two things here. One, that Ashfur already has this power and is already using Spire Sight or is planning on using Spire Sight. Or two, that Spire Sight has this ability and Ashfur also now has it. If it's the first one, then it doesn't make any sense why Spire Sight is helping Shadow Sight at all before or after this point even if it's in the most backward way possible. But if it's the second, then, like, where is this coming from? As much as evil Spire Sight makes more sense and would be kind of cool, there is absolutely no setup for this at all. Not to say that Spire Sight couldn't have a motive or a reason. I agree with Akira in thinking that his motivation could be the events that happened in Tiger Heart's shadow, but at no point has Spire Sight expressed anything resembling bitterness. And I can hear some people saying that Ashfur was the same kind of twist in Power of Three, but no, Ashfur had a lot of setup leading up to the fire scene. The pieces were all there. With Spire Sight, I'm just left questioning again what lore the authors are working on versus what's canon in the books. So anyway, Shadow Sight recovers from his near-death experience, then almost immediately commits temporary suicide in order to become a spirit again and find out that Ashfur has somehow trapped Star Clan in the dark forest in a pool under a lot of bramble. Um, I can't really explain this. This is a completely new piece of lore for how Star Clan works, so sure, I'm not gonna touch this. But Shadow Sight also finds Bramble Star Spirit trapped nearby as well. Bramble Star Spirit has been missing for most of the book and everyone was beginning to worry that he was gone for good. If only it could be that easy. This is more so frustrating because I just really, really, really want Bramble Star to remain dead, but I just know that this arc is going to end up with him back as Thunder Clan's leader. The amount of Bramble Star worship in this book is honestly ridiculous. Misty Star and Hair Star act like Bramble Star used to walk on water before the imposter took over, when Bramble Star has really just been a competent to bad leader at best. I really dislike Bramble Star, and it is time for him to go. It just also feels way too convenient that all of this possession and body swapping can take place, and we're just going to undo it all. Even if I liked Bramble Star as a character, I would be disappointed by this turn of events. We need to cycle through leaders faster in Warrior Cats, please. So now that Bramble Star Spirit has been found, Squirrel Flight, acting as the rebel leader, and Shadow Clan agree to try to do what they can to save Bramble Star's body. This angers a fraction of the other rebels who want to take out the imposter now and stop talking in circles about the issue. Honestly, I'm with them. So Stemleaf and a group of background characters from the other clans who were also part of the Rebels decide to sneak attack Brash Star in front of Bristlefrost. Bristlefrost, who made a promise to Squirrel Flight to help protect Bramble Star's body, runs to go get help and Barry Nose shows up and together they all basically kill the Rebel Cats, including Stemleaf. <laughs> Star, being absolutely paranoid at this point, accuses Barry Nose of not coming to his aid quickly enough and exiles him. 
There's also a moment where Greystripe stands up to Brash Star, and basically half of ThunderClan gets banished in one fell swoop, including Alderheart, which means that ThunderClan is without a medicine cat. And here's where another big problem I have with this book lies. This book bends over backwards to make sure that ThunderClan is portrayed as helpless victims through this whole thing. That set up at the end of Silent Thaw, where it seemed like some ThunderClan cats were going to go along with Brashstar? Nope. Gone. That can't happen, because then ThunderClan would be the bad guys, and we can't have that! Even Barry knows who was abusing his power at the end of the last book, and definitely had all the potential to be a horrible little gremlin during the events of this book, is instead just another innocent Brashstar victim. He's doing the deputy job to the best of his ability, and is painted with the same oh no, he's just scared and doesn't understand what's going on brush that everybody else in ThunderClan is. Barry Nose is a completely different cat in this book. And for that matter, the same goes for Bumblestripe. He was right there with Barry Nose, being a bastard in Silent Thaw. But suddenly in this book, he's one of the cats who gets exiled after Greystripe stands up to the imposter. And yes, I know Greystripe is Bumblestripe's father, but that doesn't ignore the fact that both of these characters have had a complete 180 in their stance from the end of the last book and the beginning of this book. Did the author who wrote Veil of Shadows not read Silent Thought? It's really frustrating! Okay, so then we get to the battle. Brashstar leads an attack on ShadowClan because Tiger Heartstar refuses to suck up to Brashstar's demands. Leafstar finally takes a side and helps ShadowClan and the rebels. Hairstar and Mistystar get WindClan and RiverClan involved, as well as fight on Brashstar's side. Quite a few background characters die, but also, Barry Nose and Hairstar. <sighs> Poor Barry Nose, man. He did not deserve to die like this. I'm honestly a little insulted for his sake. Barry Nose didn't do anything antagonistic. He just seems confused, and in the end, he chose to fight for Brashstar, and Tawny Pelt just murders him in one sentence, and then we never address Barry Nose ever again. I know Barry Nose has been a little shit since he was introduced, but to have his character completely butchered like this was shocking to see, and then have him just get unceremoniously killed off is cold. And I know I have been one of the loudest and biggest supporters of there are way too many characters, please start killing them all, but both Barry Nose and Stemleaf die such nothing deaths. They're thrown aside as if they weren't important whatsoever. And what's worse, you could have easily made it so that Barry knows at least deserved it. Like, if he had been antagonistic like it was set up. Or just call back that maybe the reason Barry knows is so supportive of Brashstar is because Bramblestar was Barry Nose's mentor. Barry Nose should have been an easy antagonist to write in here. Instead, I just feel sorry that Barry Nose got screwed over and then died for it. Thanks, I hate it. And don't even get me started on Hairstar! Oh my god! Lion Blaze is the one to deliver the killing blow to Hairstar, which he did on accident. That makes this the third time Lion Blaze has killed or nearly killed someone by accident. What the hell, Lion Blaze? But anyway. Hairstar dies and then somehow is able to come back to life, even though he absolutely shouldn't, considering that is exactly what happened to Bramblestar. I know there are some people theorizing that maybe Hairstar is possessed as well now, and while I wish that were the case, yet again, the book really didn't hint at this at all or set it up, other than the fact that it just doesn't make any sense. Thanks. I hate it. <laughs> Hairstar should have remained dead, you cowards. Hairstar's death, though, stops the fighting. Brashstar is now a prisoner of ShadowClan. Squirrelflight and the other exiles return to ThunderClan with Squirrelflight acting as temporary leader and Lionblaze as her deputy. And we're left with Squirrelflight just about to make the revelation who the imposter is. It's Ashfur. No, really. <sighs> At this rate, I'm going to place my bets now on how this is all going to shake out. 
Ashtar is going to get interrogated and talked about in circles in the next book. What should we do with Ashfur? He's not telling us anything or cooperating. Then he'll escape and cause more chaos. We'll probably get some reveal about Spire Sight or other dead cats working with him. The Warrior Code isn't going to be examined as a whole, just the Forbidden Relationships rule, which will likely remain unchanged, but the clans will vow to keep a more open-minded approach in the future, and the existing Codebreakers will be forgiven. Again. Bramble Star will regain his body back and continue leading Thunder Clan for eternity. Star Clan will return and everything will be business as usual. Oh, and of course, don't forget, Bristle Frost will absolutely be pregnant with Root Springs kids. I would love to be proven wrong about any of these plot points, please God prove me wrong, but I'll be pleasantly surprised if I am. While I didn't find this book quite as bad as River of Fire in terms of pointlessness, I was still deeply unsatisfied at how this all played out. There were some great moments, but the way the book forced this outcome to the point of disregarding previously established canon and the plot contrivances made it a really hard read for me. I really hope that the next book steps things back up and is better. Broken Code has certainly been an interesting arc, but I'm worried that all that intrigue is setting up to be nothing. I also apologize for this being a rather long and rambly drawing a blank, I feel like I'm going to be one of the few people that disliked this book, so I wanted to try to make my thoughts clear. Also, if you enjoyed this book, that's great. I'm really not trying to start any discourse here, this was just my own thoughts. Have a great week everyone, and stay inspired!